Avalanche theory has developed greatly over the last few years. This is evident by the fact that we now recognize that avalanche problems exist and that there aren't untold thousands of them, just five. And as users, we can work very well with these five avalanche problems. The first avalanche problem is the new snow problem. New snow always leads to increased avalanche danger. To get a good idea of the local conditions, we make use of the critical amount of new snow concept. How much new snow has fallen here where we are underway? Do the conditions tend toward favorable? Has it not snowed too much? If the conditions during new snowfall are favorable and the conditions before the new snow, so the old snow surface, were also favorable, then up to 50 centimeters of new snow, the situation isn't too critical. However, if the conditions are unfavorable, for example, if the old snow surface was unfavorable or the conditions during snowfall, for example, the temperature and the wind tended toward unfavorable, then it could be that 10 to 20 centimeters of new snow is enough to create an unfavorable situation. To deal with new snow, you need to make sure of two things. First of all, it's important to wait until the new snow has settled somewhat and bonds have been established between crystals. And then you should ensure that you don't have a new snow problem in persistent weak layers at the same time. We can find this out by looking at the avalanche bulletin or at the snowpack. Or perhaps we know what the old snow surface looked like before the snowfall. Another avalanche problem is the wind-drifted snow problem. The wind-drifted snow problem predominantly concerns the combination of loose snow and wind. The wind is the architect of avalanches and deposits snow very unevenly across the terrain. The irregular snow depths lead to tension in the snowpack and the formation of avalanches. This means that in the event of a wind-drifted snow problem, the key aim is to identify the locations of fresh snow drifts. The wind transports the snow from the windward to the leeward side, so from the exposed side to the sheltered side. And the snow collects on the leeward side, that's where the wind-drifted snow is, and these snow drifts must be avoided. Wind signs that hint at where wind-drifted snow is located include, for example, sastrugi, these structured surfaces with peaks pointing toward the direction the wind is coming from, Cornices, snow banners on ridges and wind-scoured ridges can also hint at the location of wind-drifted snow. In the areas where the wind meets the snow, it takes the snow crystals with it. These are then mechanically broken down and deposited in sheltered areas, meaning on the leeward side of obstacles, forming this dangerous wind-drifted snow. And finally, I need to ask myself, how old is the wind-drifted snow? Has it perhaps already healed? And how precarious was the old snow surface that the wind-drifted snow was deposited on? As a rule, the wind-drifted snow problem is over after one to three days, depending, of course, on whether the wind persists or dies down. The fresher the wind-drifted snow, the more susceptible to stress it is, and therefore, the more problematic. In addition to sharp edges when setting tracks or a strip that remains standing in the middle, wind-drifted snow can best be identified using the shovel test. This means you take a shovel full of snow, shake it, and if blocks of snow fall off or if stress cracks form in the block, then you clearly have wind-drifted snow. If it trickles loosely off the blade without tension, then the snow is unbonded. Wet snow avalanches occur predominantly in spring. Wet snow situations are caused by water seeping through the snowpack. This water can be a result of rain, then of course the rain is an additional load on the snowpack, or it can be a result of rising temperatures and the melting of the surface of the snowpack. In both cases, either a pre-existing weak layer or another layer in the snowpack gets wet and it becomes waterlogged. This lack of solidarity can cause spontaneous avalanches, and these spontaneous avalanches are the main characteristic of a wet snow situation. The best way to deal with a wet snow situation is to observe when the snowpack freezes and melts again. So we need to look at when are the skies clear at night so the snowpack can cool down, how warm will it get throughout the day, and when do we need to be back from our tour.
So if the melt freeze crust, which can bear a load, has disappeared, and you're standing knee deep in fear, it's high time you descend. It's time for you to turn back. And in the event of a wet snow avalanche, it is also recommended that you start early, get back early, as long as the snowpack stability is still okay. With a gliding snow problem, the snowpack slowly glides down toward the valley on a film of water on the ground. We can often observe fish mouths, so cracks, in the snowpack, and these indicate this danger. As unpredictable as the release of a gliding avalanche can be, it could be in the middle of the night or during the day, they actually cause very few accidents. And this is because A, we can easily identify the situation, and B, we can easily avoid the dangerous areas. Of all the avalanche problems, the most difficult to identify is the persistent weak layer problem. With new snow, you can see the new snow. With wind-drifted snow, you can see the wind signs. With wet snow, you can see the wet snow. And with the gliding snow problem, you can see the avalanche mouths or fish mouths, but you can't see persistent weak layers at all on the surface. This means that planning and the information from the avalanche bulletin are particularly important as an alternative or in addition to this, in the event of a persistent weak layer problem, it makes sense to carry out a snowpack test because this way you can identify the weak layers in the old snowpack. Basically, in the event of persistent weak layers, you should always move defensively because although the probability of an avalanche is very low, the extent of the damage caused by this type of avalanche is often very high. The past has shown us that major accidents with five, six, seven fatalities were always due to persistent weak layers. This means that in the event of a persistent weak layer problem, you should move defensively, be even more strict about following the 30-degree rule, and, if possible, carry out a snowpack test. Nothing reflects the ability and knowledge of a ski tour quite like the capacity to move optimally in the mountains. Avoiding dangerous areas and terrain traps and making use of favorable terrain features are things that need to be learned. It's a learning process that spans years, decades, but that's what makes touring exciting. And if you stick to it, you'll always be able to enjoy safe and wonderful experiences.